what's kind of eerie is the fact that uh, the business as usual projections, even even the cautious ones produced by IPCC, are still giving us about four degrees of warming by the end of the century, and uh, with two degrees has been taken arbitrarily as the level beyond which nasty things happen. I think the main thing that we really need to focus on is divestment from fossil fuels. Uh, it's a massive, massive step and it's not going to happen overnight and no one's asking for it to happen overnight, so saying it's difficult, uh, we know that. So I think leaders today, you know, the, the question is, should leaders be asking the question of themselves, what could we do or what should we do? And I think leaders today have got to ask this question, what should we do? Because I think the should we forces a moral conversation. If people don't do it now, then when are they going to do it? So they need to do it now. They need to do it right now. And the meeting in Paris is essential. Fossil fuels has been the story of our civilization. So much of what we take for granted, you know, our infrastructure, our electricity, our running water, all the good stuff, we do owe to fossil fuels, but that doesn't mean that we have to owe our future to fossil fuels. And we have a choice, you know, we have a choice. We understand the challenges that we have, and in a sense, it's no choice at all, because we know if we pursue our love affair with fossil fuels, the world that we will end up in is a world in which, you know, you wouldn't want to live. It doesn't matter how many products or services you have. It's a world which will be significantly impacted, you know, widespread losses of biodiversity, you know, climate chaos. It's a world that I don't think anybody would really choose to live. You know, widespread losses of biodiversity, you know, climate chaos, you know, climate, you know, chaos. climate chaos. It's a world that I don't think anybody would really choose to live, would really choose to live. What is COP21? Right, well, these are the Paris climate talks at which the world is agreeing, in, is to agree, we certainly hope they're going to agree, on a new deal about what every country is going to do to cut their carbon emissions down below the level at which we would see two degree warming of the planet. And that two degree is a really important figure because the science, the best science we have says once you get past that point, it's irreversible. So this is the point we've really got to act. We haven't got long left. And this is you know, the point of action. There remains an outside chance that we can hold the temperature rise to 2 degrees C, temp uh, two degrees C Celsius. Um, but to do that, what we're going to have to do is, those of us particularly that are quite high emissions, which generally are the, are the wealthier people that consume a lot of goods as well, we are going to have to radically reduce the, the level of energy consumption that we have today. So that may mean that we have to um, obviously have smaller cars, drive less, fly much less if we fly at all, um, but also you know, in, in terms of the goods that we consume, try to consume goods that have much less of an embodied energy. So there are things like that we need to be doing to dramatically reduce the energy consumption. And I'm, when I say dramatically, I mean we have 50, 60, 70 percent reductions in our energy consumption by those of us that are the high emitters. Laurel. I'm 12 years old and I'm here on behalf of the Children Against Global Warming petition. What I know about climate change is that we're burning carbon fuels which is producing CO2 which is trapping the sunlight trying to escape the earth and is heating up our atmosphere and creating ice caps to melt and sea levels to rise. I'd like to see a future where we've completely got rid of fossil fuels. They're still under the ground, they're not being burnt. I'd like to see when I'm driving through the countryside, 
fields of wind turbines because that's what we need, fields of solar panels because that is what we need and you know everyone coming together as a community, as the world and sorting ourselves out and having a better life and everything's as it should be. The press and the TV do not reflect public opinion, the internet does. It's a real forum for public debate and it will help us to change things quickly. You're not alone. People know what's going on. It's massive. Demonstrate wherever possible. Win the fight against fracking. Act as soon as possible. The clock is ticking. I've been involved in um, green politics and sustainable energy for 40 years, so you can imagine I look at this current moment and I think to myself, is it any different from all the moments we've been through over the last 40 years? And the truth of it is, it is absolutely different. And it's different because technology now allows us to talk with conviction and with good, strong, empirical evidence that we can build a 100% renewable energy world within the course of the next couple of decades. That's an amazing thing. It wasn't available to us back in the 70s or 80s, or even the 90s. Now, it's available. Secondly, we've got millions of people the world over who want to make this revolution come alive in their own communities. The power of community energy today is quite extraordinary. So whilst we're surrounded with a sea of data that necessarily looks pretty grim, if you actually think about where the science tells us we are, actually these things are moving at such a pace. Technology, community empowerment, an ability to mobilize capital to transform energy systems. They're moving so fast that perhaps we should just take a little bit less time to do the despair and get out there and build that world now. It makes sense to act now because the longer we don't means there's the harder hill or mountain we have to climb later. We have to do it. There's no, there's no kind of, a, at some point, uh, maybe we'll get out of it. There are 20 years, two decades, to get it right. And actually, if we don't bother with these two, two decades, it's possible we'll never be able to stabilise the climate or make it safe again. And that means we're wrecking the planet for the, pre, the, the subsequent generations. Do we really want to be in that situation? How's big business functioning today? I think that it's um, I think that it's very much focused on the short term. I think that big business today is also not taking into account the boundaries that this planet has, and I don't think that biz big business today is really taking into account or thinking about making money in a more caring and conscious way. And so, I think that its focus still is on the shareholder. So the only stakeholder that big business is looking after today, I think is the shareholder. And, um, and I think it needs to change. If we're going to avoid dangerous climate change, then we need to leave the majority of the world's fossil fuel resources in the ground. So there are a number of campaigns right now, the leave it in the ground campaign, which is tremendously challenging for a number of reasons. Perhaps first reason is what you're doing is you're walking away from trillions of dollars. Right? So, you know, you can't have all those trillions of dollars, you've got to go and make money somewhere else. Divestment from fossil fuels is taking our money, your money, out of uh, industry that pollutes and investing it more ethically into, ideally into renewable technology. Um, it means not allowing your money to support the profits or the development of a fundamentally unsustainable business model um, and instead placing pressure on governments and on industry to invest and to regulate for cleaner energy for a long-term sustainable decarbonised future.
calling for fossil fuels to be left in the ground. This is absolutely critical. At the moment, all the international discussions are about what we do about the consumption end of it, what we do about reducing our demand. But unless the supply is being reduced at the same time, unless we stop pulling coal, oil, gas out of the ground, it will continue to be burnt. My message to everyone, including the world leaders, all the supporters who are going to be turning up to the Paris COP would just be, Let's take action now. It's an, there's, we've spent enough time not taking responsibility for our actions. We need to face up to the fact that we need to make a change now or else it's going to be too late. What I would like to say to the world leaders in Paris is stop saying you're going to act and actually act. It's like getting out of bed in the morning. Don't think you're going to do it. Do it. We can't talk anymore about intergenerational equity or the future. The future has arrived. Everyone alive today and their children is affected and will be affected by what's going on. This is the generation, you know, people my sort of age who have their last piece to give, your children's sort of age who now will are stepping into their adulthood. If we can pull those two ends together and a big chunk in the middle, everything's possible. Will we do it? There's the question. A lot of the time people talk about the idea of youth um, having the, the chance to, to really make these changes and we want to and we have the enthusiasm and the passion to do that but we need people of the older generation to lead on that because they're the ones in power. The best thing that people can do is just to look to what's happening in their own community, in their own workplace, through their colleagues, their peer group, their faith community, whatever it might be, see what the positive signals are, see who's doing what to introduce community energy schemes, whatever it might be, and get behind them. Add your strength to what's already there. Don't try and recreate the wheel. Cut down your consumption of animal products. It's amazing the amount of greenhouse gas emissions as well as other environmental damage that the very high consumption of meat, and dairy, eggs included um, in, in countries like our own are causing. If you do that, you're already going to make a big difference. In order for us to, as a government and uh, as a country, to tackle climate change and to decarbonise our energy in the way that we absolutely must do, we do need cross-party agreement and we need to make sure that there's a plan that goes beyond the next general election. We need to talk seriously about decades and decades of plans, not just from now until the next general election. We can only change the world by getting together. We are an uber social animal. We are, we are the most social mammal of any kind except possibly naked mole rats. Um, and, 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 and in that remarkable position, we should be using our super social brains to make best use of it. You know, there's lots of things we can do, but should we be doing them? And I think this becomes even more important in a world where consumers have got the power. Because you might say, oh, I broke no laws, but if I as a consumer don't think that that feels right, I'll boycott your brand, I'll boycott your business, and I will tell millions of followers that I might have on Twitter uh, as to why you shouldn't purchase that brand or be associated with that organization. And so this, this moral influence 
in the decisions that we make, I think can only come through if we ask the question, what should we do, rather than what could we do. It's a choice. These are powerful choices and they're powerful motivations. But the most important thing to stress is there's nothing physically impossible about some of the challenges that we need to address. Stepping forward into the unknown is what we have done and always will do. And if we can just accept that, relax into it and then walk forwards in the joyful expectation that we can create the world of our longing and that it will be fun and, and there will be challenge, but we can do that. Then I think we find our way through. <laughs>